Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next hour is devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and ships and sailing wax, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. A time for the open-minded, willing to challenge some of those old ideas behind what we think we know, who we are, and who we might just become. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, our chat room is open, and my partner, Ravinder, awaits you there now. You can log on by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. We have a great chat room and some wonderful people that are pretty regular. So, Ravinder, tell us all about it, please. We do. We have a great chat room. We have our regulars that come, and then we have other people that come in occasionally. There are some people who come in, but they don't speak. Um, There are some that just pop in and ask their question and pop back out. So, whatever category you are in, you are more than welcome. Do come join us. That is provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. Now, your chat room, you often show videos in your chat room, um, you're posting earls, There's a, often the guest or some of their staff come into the chat room and they uh, lend additional information to the show. And if you can't get to that chat room because you're in your automobile or you're in your, you know, you're in your office, you're doing something, I don't know, whatever reason you can't get to it during the live broadcast, are you just, that's it? Sucks? No, no, not at all. Although I will definitely reiterate the fact if you are driving, please do not come in the chat room. <laughs> uh, keep your eyes on the road in front of you. Uh, no, you can always access the chat room afterwards. You can read through the entire conversation. Um, and then, yeah, we do often post additional links, other information in there. We get clarifications. Sometimes you don't catch a name or something on the air, and then we'll try to post it in the chat room. So you can go back and look through that and get all that information. Okay, and you just go to Provocative Enlightenment. Yeah, just you go to that particular the... show. They'll, they'll all be there. Okay, yes. Good. In this week's Spotlight, we shine a light on a really big question. I was recently asked to explain what I meant by God. Now, that's a good task for anyone, including those of the highest clerical rank in any religion. I might have quit with something like, well, God to me is the grand organizing designer. You know, G-O-D, grand organizing designer. But that somehow is totally unsatisfactory. Indeed, it simply replaces one name with another. That said, definitions such as omnipotent and omniscient find their way into contradictions like, well, if God is all-powerful, then can he build a rock so large he can't lift it? Or, if God is all-knowing, then he already knows what I will do, and that means there's no free will as such, for everything must be predetermined in some way. The various contradictions that are met when passing out flat definitions about any form of divine creator are one of the reasons admonishments such as refrain from the mysteries exist. As such, the theologian is quick to point out that God cannot be adequately described because our limited minds are not capable of grasping the infinite. Blaise Pascal offered up a wager known as the Pascal Wager. Here is what he said. If one bets that God does exist, and he does, you win everything. To lose, you lose nothing. Should one bet that God does not exist and win, you win nothing. But to lose, you lose everything. Now, many philosophers have taken issue with this simple proposition, but nevertheless, there is merit. This is what I decided my best answer was. God to me is hope. Without God, we're just meat machines destined to join the universe as mass and energy in the never-ending continuum of decay. I would like to think that my consciousness somehow survives. Just for me, the thought that there is a divine creator gives rise to the possibility that I may continue on in some form following this life. And that gives me hope. Hope is the sense that everything somehow matters. Hope is the steel that undergirds the notion of purpose, 
For what is purpose without life beyond death? Some may insist that purpose can be derived without some otherworldly perspective, and for some time and some folks that may be true. There are, after all, purely utilitarian objectives that should be considered, but if utilitarianism is what you want, then Pascal definitely provides one. Hope is what gives meaning to life, and it is the mechanism that makes the loss of our loved ones somehow bearable. Hope is the mechanism that assuages grief and adds meaning to our lives. For me, I may never know in this lifetime the true nature of God, but I will enjoy the experience of hope every day, confident that there is always a tomorrow somewhere. My thoughts anyway, what are yours, Ravinder? I think that's interesting. It's a very practical application for the whole idea of God. It does bring quality to your life. It does give you purpose and structure. Um, Yeah, you picked a nice easy topic today, though, defining God. Okay. Um, But yeah, I think that's as bad as far as you can go. It is hope. There There is just the practical aspect of it, you know, improving the quality of life. All right, every week I read some of your letters as our way of involving you while paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Last week our show was all about choices and illusions. And Dira wrote, I love your show and I especially enjoyed your book, Choices and Illusions. It literally changed my life. Rhonda wrote, Choices and Illusions weeds through years of research to champion mental fitness. The content is generous, presented in neutralizing stories, physiological models, modest examples, and products such as validated inner talk therapies. The elephant example, along with the good luck, bad luck, who knows short story, and the storing cortisol enlightenment were some of my fair, personal favorites. Anyone interested in intermind relations or those studying disciplines with the intent to help others get out of mental ruts will want to read Choices and Illusions. Chris wrote, the idea that our subconscious mind is in charge and we don't even know what's in it is frightening. Your show helped me to understand how I could change the content of my mind. Thank you for sharing. Elizabeth wrote, I had no idea that the placebo effect could be so powerful. It seems that it's all about what we believe. CB commented, maybe we need a new name for placebo effect considering all the research that is showing how powerful it is. Rachel wrote, Hi, I'm a nutritionist and life coach, and I am constantly referring clients to your Inner Talk programs. I've used them personally with great success. Well, thank you, Rachel. Carrie wrote, I have been using and promoting your Inner Talk products over quite a few years. Most recently, I've been using the Healing MP3 of guided imagery led by Eldon Taylor himself, which I have found enormously helpful. I like that. Eldon Taylor himself, like I'm not on the others. <laughs> Kerry, for the record, I record sometimes with others, uh, but I am on all of the programs. I personally supervise every step of their creation. Lori wrote, I'm so happy that I found you several years ago. Your programs have helped me with addiction issues, codependence, and I love the self-confidence videos. I believe in your programs and I know what they can do for people. FYI, I share your site with friends and family and those in the counseling industry as well. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. And if you're ever in Washington, D.C. for events, please let me know. Well, I'll definitely do that, Lori, and thank you for your support. All right, that's all the time we're going to take for letters today, but I do invite you to opine by emailing me at eldon at eldontaylor.com. That's E-L-D-O-N at eldontaylor.com or by joining me on Facebook. We sincerely appreciate your comments and feedback, don't we, Ravinder? Yes, we do, most certainly. Now to this week's show, and I've been really looking forward to this one, as has my pretty bride, Rav. Love for Animals, Large and Small, with Ingrid Newkirk. Do animal rights matter? There is a great division in our country about this issue, but more and more folks are coming around and beginning to recognize how important animal rights are. One of the pioneering organizations championing animal rights began over 35 years ago. That organization is known as PETA, and today we have a co-founder of PETA as our guest. 
So let me tell you a little about today's guest. People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, PETA, President and Co-Founder, Ingrid Newkirk, has led the world's largest animal rights organization for more than 35 years. Her passion and dedication to making this world a better place for all living beings has inspired countless others to do what they can to help animals. She has spoken internationally on animal rights issues. She is also the author of One Can Make a Difference, Let's Have a Dog Party, 50 Awesome Ways Kids Can Help Animals, Making Kind Choices, The PETA Celebrity Cookbook, I haven't read that one, 250 Things You Can Do to Make Your Cat Adore You, Free the Animals, and the PETA Practical Guide to Animal Rights. All right, on that, let's get her in here. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Ingrid Newkirk. Thank you so much, and thanks very much to both of you for having me. I heard your fan mail. It's quite impressive. Oh, good. We, we Thank you. But uh, I have really been looking forward to this show. You are one of those people that, uh, you know, I don't need to say this, it, you are very controversial. You are very inspiring. You are you you're you're in a league all by yourself, and you have you know almost single handedly in many instances pushed forward the idea of animal consciousness, animal rights, and uh, my wife and I are both strong supporters of that. But <clears throat> on this show, we like to consider three things. Who is the messenger? What is the message? And how do we use it? So to that end, please tell us a little about yourself and why and when you became interested in animal rights. Well, I first became interested in animals without the rights part. I'm 67 now, and back when I was in my 20s, there wasn't an animal rights movement. Nobody had heard the term, and we didn't think about it. I grew up thinking that it was awful to be cruel. You know, nobody should kick the dog or starve a horse or tie a firecracker to a cat's tail or anything like that. That would be disgusting. But we ate animals. I had my first fur coat when I was 19. Um, my father and I basically ate our way through the animal kingdom. Uh, he was a, a gourmand. And uh, it just, I had a fur hat. I remember I loved and uh, a toy that was made of animal skin. It just, we didn't make the connection. We didn't connect the dots until back in the uh, late 70s, Peter Singer came out with a book. Some people call it the Animal Rights Bible. It was called Animal Liberation. You can still get it today. And it proposed that perhaps we shouldn't think of animals as just something out there that we should be kind to because after all it's good to be kind but we should go a step further and think of them as just like ourselves other living beings who feel pain and fear who love who get lonely who do everything from flirting to grieving <laughs> and that we should not just shrug that off but think then don't we have a responsibility not to cause any needless suffering don't we have a responsibility not to stick bits of them in our mouths and make shoes out of them um, and test cosmetics and medicines down their throats? They're just like us. So just as we learned to open our sphere of compassion, I suppose you could call it, to people with disabilities and to women and people of other nations and so on, um, to consider children and orphans. We used to do awful things to all of those groups. Now we need to come to terms with the fact that all the other animals, of which we're just one, uh, deserve our consideration, our magnanimity, our compassion just as much and change our behaviors, even if it's inconvenient to do so. So that's, that's really that. You know, there. I, I think people have been sensitive, some people have been sensitive to um, animal rights for many, many years. Long, I mean, uh, probably going back to the first pet that a human being brought up to their side and 
that that comforted them. So maybe as long as there has been a relationship between man and animal. But there has also been this ongoing, you know, the 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 right of man, the dominion, if you will, out of the biblical scripture of of men over the animal world. And and, and you know, I can remember the American Beef Council running ads, you're not a man if you don't eat beef and and in 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 fight, if you will, it, against um, vegetarian efforts and vegan efforts and so on. You heard today's setup. Contrasted to that view is a view that animals have a soul, that they have a spirit as well, that there is an afterlife for them. What's your view on that? Well, let me go back, if I if I may, to a couple of things you said because you hit some nails on the head, certainly. Uh, You're right. I mean, absolutely. We look back to Leonardo da Vinci, for example, and even beyond that, back to Plato's time. And you see uh, philosophers grappling with this idea that we treat animals as if we are gods and they are trash. And yet, this is a continuum of, and and the lack of understanding of all their wonderful traits. Um, And we did declare war on the animals, even though some of us going back in history, have been fond of animals, had animals in our home, abhorred cruelty, uh, abhorred hunting, and, and so on. But I think what you said was interesting about dominion, because what we have done, I think, is mistake domination for dominion. Right. With, with dominion, someone once said to me, you know, uh, the British Empire, it went out and the Queen, Queen Victoria, um, had Indian subjects, but that didn't mean that she could stick electrodes in their heads or cut off their feet and make umbrella stands out of them. Uh, It meant that she was supposed to be, in the same way we look at a god supposed to be, caring of her subjects. And in dominion, surely it's that gives you, because you have so much power, more power than they, have to look after them, not to exploit um, these animals as if they are there for the picking, as if they're, you know, a hamburger on the hoof or a purse that just hasn't been made into one yet. But we get away from the idea of domination, which is a very scared way to live, that you feel you have to show who's boss all the time, and go to dominion, which is caretaking. Um, and and as you said, you know, we've had this historical battle about how to treat animals, which is coming more into the fore now, that some people are saying, well, they're creation. You know, <laughs> where Jesus is talking about a, a, even a sparrow, my father was, you know, uh, all these wonderful things that are said about caretaking and looking after versus, oh, they're there for you to squash and to disregard, yet they have all these traits, these characteristics, these behaviors, these feelings, they're sentient life forms. They're not rocks and tables. They're just like us. They're all part, if you believe in creation of creation, and if not, you just look at who they are, and we don't want this silly, macho idea. If they have a soul, and of course some people believe they do, then more reason to treat them well in this life. They're just like us. If they don't have a soul, and some people believe they don't, then what a a terrible thing to treat them badly in this life if they're not going to have a heaven afterwards. You know, I I guess there's a part of me, you're right, the original meaning of the word dominion was custody to take care of, to protect, to to, yeah. to oversee, um, and I guess there's this part of me that you know when I someone that abuses an animal, whether they have a soul or not, is subtracting from their own soul because they're innocent, they're unable to protect themselves for all intent and purposes, and and you, you know. I see, I I guess I fail to see anything that we gain out of abusing an animal. Um, You certainly have been uh, approached with that question. What is it that 
people feel they gain out of animal abuse? I think they gain a sense of power. You know, there has been so much written about hunting, for example, about how people who feel disregarded, disrespected themselves, who are belittled, want to show that they're really strong and fierce. And this is this business of um, machismo, is that they will then go out, and if you read hunting magazines, as I unfortunately have to, you see this bravado where you've got doves and ducks who are the most gentle animals. I mean, the dove of peace and a duck. I mean, what kind of threat is a duck? And ducks, of course, mate for life. Geese mate for life. They could teach us a thing or two. And they're gummed down. They only weigh a few pounds. How can that show that you are big and somebody to reckon with. That shows that you are a weak person with no self-discipline, with no understanding, with no vision, and that you're a bully. And everybody knows that bullies are cowards. So people try to build themselves up by going, and I've seen this in slaughterhouses, where somebody actually cut out from the womb of a cow her calf and slung the calf across the slaughterhouse floor, laughing. And we've seen people in slaughterhouses, men, pick up a brick, a cinder block actually, and drop it on the head of a lame pig who is struggling to escape and laugh. And they think that, look at me, aren't I big, aren't I tough? What is going on in their minds? I don't know, but it certainly isn't a rational thought. It's a disgusting thought. Someone okay, now, to, said, to, now uh, to play uh, devil's one, advocate, yeah. not, I mean, you know, what you're citing are, of course, atrocities. They're, they're gross and they upset everyone. But, you know, I, I have friends that are cattle ranchers. <clears throat> and I'm thinking of one in particular that uh, will brave the worst possible weather to save a calf. Uh, to bring it into warmth. Um, th- th- he cares for his cattle uh, like they're part of the family. And yet, the economic side of things, uh, he harvests these cattle nevertheless. So, I, I, right. th- the notion that, I, I mean, I think there are other things going on besides the cowardice that you cite. I don't disagree with what you're talking about in slaughter yards and that kind of treatment. There's nothing humane about that at all. We would not do that to someone who had committed the most heinous of acts that we then were going to punish with capital punishment. I do not disagree with that whatsoever. But I think there is also a lot of other things that go on, tradition, economics, yeah. uh, et cetera. And, and I guess in fairness to that and in fairness to those people who really do care about the animals that they have custody over, but nevertheless find themselves in an industry, maybe because, you know, that's what their daddy did and what their daddy's daddy did. You know, I don't think we can fairly call them cowards. I think there's something else at play here. I'm with you here. Let me just say back to what we've seen in slaughterhouses, what we've seen on factory farms, in laboratories, on fur farms, in entertainment industry even. Those are everyday occurrences. We mustn't think that there's some weird thing that happens only once in a while because they are everyday occurrences and they are willful acts of cruelty where somebody gets a, 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 a thrill out of it or is thinks that it builds them up. That's one kind of cruelty. The others may not be any less uh, harmful to the animals or painful to the animals. I agree with you. You know, cattle ranchers, for the most part, although we've been on some ranches where cows and calves will be kicked in the head, electroshock, mocked, you... You know, there is a sort of fantasy myth about how lovely it is. And that the business of the cattle rancher going out in the snow for, for a snowstorm or the sheep farmer to rescue the ewe or, the, or bring the calf home, of course, that's a commodity. 
those animals are all commodities and they're not family members because you don't then put your family members into a truck and send them off to a place, in a slaughterhouse, where they're going to be hung up by a leg and have their throats slit. So th- there is a myth that it's family, but they also, they say their daddies did it and their grandfathers did it. You know, I grew up on a farm. My great uncle was a farmer. And they didn't think then that they must think now because there's enough information in the news about who animals are, not what, and how they suffer in these ways and their relationship with each other and their incredible intelligence of all different kinds that we don't... They, people can't escape knowing now and really Point well made. they'll have a think I'm about I'm going to have it. to interrupt you, uh, Ingrid. We have a break here, and I don't want the computer to kick us out. That's a point well made. <laughs> we'll pick it up when we come back. We're speaking with Ingrid Newkirk about her life and work sponsoring animal rights. Now, we have a video for you in our chat room today featuring our guests discussing six easy ways to help animals. So, if you're not in the chat room, now's a great time to get on over there. It's provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. Okay, we'll be right back. Please stay tuned. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Do you feel like you've become lost in the funhouse, only seeing the reflection of yourself, past, future, and present, but unable to find the real you? I invite you to step through the doorway and onto a pathway leading to understanding of your mind, your choices, and the influences that surround you. Read Eldon Taylor's New York Times best-selling book, Choices and Illusions. Now expanded, updated, and revised, it will provide you with real-life examples of how you can break free of your current perceptions and begin your journey to How High is Up. Get your copy today from all bookstores or online from Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. And welcome back. If you've just joined us, we're chatting with Ingrid Newkirk about her life and work sponsoring animal rights. You can learn more about our guest and her work by visiting her website at Ingrid Newkirk. That's I-N-G-R-I-D-N-E-W-K-I-R-K. One word, IngridNewkirk.com. Now, we ask our guests for their favorite music, music that has some true significance to them. Music psychology is a hobby of mine, and it has a field of research with practical relevance in many areas. All right, we just played Don't Kill the Animals by Lene Lovick and Nina Hagen. So please tell us, uh, why is this music important to you, Ingrid, and how does it instruct us about who you are? Well, first, may I go back and say that's not the website address. I don't know where that came from. It's actually P-E-T-A for Peter, dot org. Oh. Just Peter dot oh. org. Oh. <laughs> well, there is a website, IngridNewkirk.com. At least my well, staff says there mine. is. <laughs> but you want it as PETA? Give it to me again. PETA.com? Yes. I do not. Whoever set that up, I do not have one. It's Peter dot org, O-R-G. Okay, Peter dot org. All of you out there listening... Uh, to learn more, go to PETA, P-E-T-A, dot org. All right. Yes. Glad you corrected and, that. Thank you. And and on it, you can get everything that you need, I hope, from vegan recipes, um, where to get leather alternatives and faux wool. You can learn about what things to protest in laboratories. Masses of information. If you have a child in school or you're in school, then there are alternatives to dissection. It's all there, and we hope that it's made really, really easy for people to enlighten them and educate them and then tell them how they can make a kind choice in absolutely everything. Good. All right. Now, why the music? I mean, as though I can't guess. (laughs) I'm I'm very fond of that song, Don't Kill the Animals. Um, I know Lena Lovett and uh, Nina Hagen. Uh, They're... uh, 
both European singers. They're, they've done a lot um, of other work, but that's one of my favorites because it just is a gleeful song. They're, they have a video that goes with it where they're dancing about and they're letting animals go from all sorts of bad situations, cutting the chains to let them off the, uh, go free. And it, it's just a joyous thing. Speaking of the video, uh, one of them is in a leopard skin looking leotard. Um, <laughs> yeah. Doesn't that send a, you know, a, a message that uh, is disrespectful of the whole theme? Oh, gosh, no. No, she's in a leotard. It's spandex. And it's quite clearly not made from animal skin. It's, um, uh, it's what it is is actually respectful to say that she loves animals so much, she cares about them, she thinks of herself as one of them, and she's dressing up like a, a tiger or a leopard or whoever it is that she's uh, that is that definitely a leopard. <laughs> All right, let me ask you this: <laughs> What are you proudest of by way of your accomplishments with PETA? Well, I don't know about proud, but um, pleased, I would say. The number one thing is how many young people are not going to grow up the way I did, taking animal things for granted. They now see them as a lot of young people now see animals as just like themselves, and they don't want to wear them and eat them and buy products that are tested on them and go to see the elephants standing on their head in the circus. But if you wanted something tangible, the thing I usually point to is we... If you're watching TV and you see mannequins in a car crash test or mannequins, you know, driving down the road in some car commercial, that's because we stopped the use of animals, pigs and dogs and baboons, in car crash tests worldwide, from General Motors to all of them. No car company now smashes animals into a wall to test the steering wheel. They all use computerized mannequins because of our uh, very vigorous campaign years ago. That's fantastic. Let me ask you, I mean, you you have to take some credit for just raising animal awareness, and more and more states now have implemented laws that actually punish, um, you know, most usually it's a misdemeanor, but in a couple of instances I can think of felonies for abuse of animals. Uh, that's got to rank right up there among some of your highest achievements, doesn't it? I think it's very good, and it, it certainly, you're right, is a recognition that you can't just be cruel to animals and get away with it. So you're right, a lot of states are now moving that when it's wanton cruelty, that distinction that you made earlier, it's not a casual neglect, it's and a deliberate act of cruelty, instead of being a misdemeanor, many states are making those felonies. And, of course, some states are saying that if you have a record of wanton cruelty to animals, then you must register in the same way that you would register as a sex offender. Uh, So people can keep their animals away from you (laughs) and know that you're trouble. Um, But there are other things, too. The bullhook bans are very important. Many states and counties have banned that fireplace poker-like thing, the stick with the metal hook on the end, that circuses use to keep elephants in line by jabbing it under their arms or behind their ears where you can't see the mark. And they're banning that, and when they do, it means the circuses can't bring elephants to town, and that means they're not in the box cars, standing in their own filth for days, and they're not chained up in the basement of some uh, arena somewhere. So the elephants are going away from the circus, and that is wonderful. There's here, and I'm just going to mention this, I'm sure you're aware of it, but uh, there is also a correlation, some data suggests a correlation, that's how I should put this, a positive correlation between people that abuse animals and that same person being abusive towards other human beings. Um, so it, it, it makes sense to me that they do register. But now in juxtaposition to that, how do you feel about, okay, look, the state passes a law, it's a felony or misdemeanor, depending on the state, 
to deliberately abuse an animal, willfully abuse the animal. And yet, <clears throat> that same state may pass a law that makes it illegal for you to videotape uh, activities within uh, a slaughter yard, as a case in point. If you enter, even enter with a camera, you can be arrested and, and your, your video material confiscated. How, I mean, how does that happen? Well, it's a, an excellent question. It shouldn't happen. It shouldn't happen in a society like ours in the 21st century, but it's done to protect business interests people who run factory farms and who do things to animals like mutilate them, de-beak them, and so on, don't want people looking. And so you do get farm interests particularly, but also other interests, mostly farming, to talk to their legislators and say, you know, we've got to have this law. Uh, they're called ag-gag laws, as I'm sure you know, agricultural gag laws. And they would make it illegal for even a whistleblower who works inside one of these places legitimately and right. who sees something illegal being done by the farm to tell authorities, to tell law enforcement that this illegal activity is going on. We have defeated ag-gag laws in 11 states. And when they crop up, our lawyers and other people in the media who are concerned about freedom of speech and jump on them and defeat them. There are only two that have managed to pass, and I think at some point they'll be ruled unconstitutional. That is not what America is all about. It's about public accountability, you know? I certainly hope so. I mean, it's definitely speaking out of two sides of the same mouth, and it's clear that it's, you know, it is uh, big money big money that's protecting itself in, uh, in that process. Let me ask you a couple of <clears throat> controversial questions. First of all, you know, I'm going to preface this with I have a great deal of admiration for you, and I can even excuse what I see as sometimes, oh, maybe stretching the truth some. But, for example, you ran an ad, a PETA ad, that essentially told everybody that if mom ate chicken, their sons were going to have a reduced penis size. Where did you get the data to support that claim? <laughs> there was actually a study about that. Um, I haven't got it with me, or I would have if I knew you were bringing it up, and I can provide it to anybody. But it's really... It I would love it. I searched high and low and could not find it. <laughs> we will find it for you. Absolutely. No, we can't just... Um, it may be that the one study isn't going to hold up, but we thought it was fun to do. It would make people come to the site and see what we were talking about. <laughs> and sometimes we do very provocative things. Um, but it wasn't just pulled out of thin air. It was an it actual would... study. That would certainly turn Mr. Machismo away from chicken, I'll guarantee you. That was our hope, yes. Yeah. It was that it really the men reading it would think, uh oh, not going to read a, eat any more chicken. But of course we do know that if, that the hormones in chickens are responsible if you eat enough chicken and chicken is in everything now, from chicken salad to fried chicken and so on. If you if a man eats enough chicken um, they develop breast. They develop breast tissue from the female hormones that are fed to chickens. And there are many studies about that. That's not even controversial. Well, I don't know about eating the chicken and developing breasts, but you're right about the chemistry <laughs> part. Okay. All right. Now, here goes another one. I mean, first of all, you got a bullseye on you, on your back. You know that. Uh, oh, yeah. Everybody that's in the meat industry, all of the money that's involved in in that industry, uh, if they can find some way to attack you, they're going to come after you. And and yeah. and uh, you've lived with that long enough. So one of the things that naysayers have to say about PETA it, is re regarding all of the animals that you euthanize. Now, mm -hmm. Why is it that the euthanasia rates are so much higher for PETA 
than they are for other animal shelters. I mean, I've got one number here in front of me that um, essentially says uh, this was an animal shelter in Norfolk, Virginia, put down 1,792 animals in one year, 82% greater than any other facility in the area. Why is that? It's very easy to explain because um, it's funny in a way that the people who started that whole thing is hate PETA because they kill animals. They don't say euthanize, they say kill. Um, are the people who kill billions, they're in the meat trade, they kill billions of animals for no good reason whatsoever, other than that they like the taste of them. For us, we run one shelter. That's the shelter you mentioned. It's in Norfolk, Virginia. And we do it out of necessity. We don't want to be in the sheltering business. But we're in a huge poverty pocket, upper North Carolina, lower Virginia. The cost of veterinary care is astronomical. And if you go to our site, there's actually a a little video you can watch that will show you the condition of the animals we accept. We accept, we call it a shelter of lost resort. And we accept the old, the sick, the dying, the too aggressive to place, all the animals that the no-kill shelters in our area turn their backs on, will not accept, do not take in, because they're not adoptable. We are not in the adoption business, although we adopt a lot of animals too, but we mostly refer any adoptable animals to adoption shelters. What we do is provide free of charge euthanasia services for people who cannot afford the high cost of euthanasia at the vet. And that is a lot of people. They will let that poor animal whom they love just die of cancer, wrecked with cancer or tumors. You can see the condition of these animals and you can read the letters from all the people who thank us for providing this free service. And we could easily say no. We don't want to be tainted with this statistic that the meat industry throws around. We don't want to be caught. We could easily just say no, the way the no-kill shelters say no. But we can't because we have a conscience, and we cannot look at that in our own neck of the woods and say, can't help you, go away. So we do. We let people be with their animals when they're put down and hold them. We cry with them. We bury them for nothing for them. But let me just say one more thing, is that we also work at the root of the overpopulation crisis for dogs and cats, because that's what we've got, homeless animals coming out of our ears in this country, every part of this country. And we do that because also in our neck of the woods, we have a fleet, not just one, but a fleet of Winnebago-sized, Bay and neuter and free veterinary care services and last year alone we sterilized 15,107 dogs and cats for low to no cost and provided all free veterinary care from flea and tick prevention so that people, even surgeries, even amputations, free so that people who couldn't afford those services could keep those animals at home and not turn them into a a shelter or put them on the street. So we do more than all of the no-kill shelters in our area combined, and we work on an ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure as well. So our figures, if you look at them all, are all pretty impressive. Understood. I'm going to have, I've got one more hot one for you. And, yep. and and I don't consider these to be really hot. What the you know these are the kinds of questions that, that folks throw out there when they want to discredit you. And I want you to have the opportunity to provide the answer like you just did, which makes perfect sense. But you you have an executive, Mary Beth Sweetland, who uses insulin injections for her diabetes. <laughs> Sorry to laugh. <laughs> And, and you know where I'm going with this. I mean, I it was go ahead. Yes. developed from animals. So, I mean, how do you balance that? I mean, the development of the insulin at the expense of animals, but you have someone who is dependent upon that very insulin for her health and well-being. Where's the balance? 
Well, actually, we don't. That's another of those things. It's like the Doberman in the closet with the burglar's fingers in his mouth. It's another of those myths. Um, Miss Sweetland hasn't been with us for many, many years, many, many years. And uh, what she actually did is she uh, wrote a piece talking about how she used to take insulin and uh, pork insulin, which is what it was commonly made of, used to cause all sorts of side effects, anything up to anaphylactic shock, and that how wonderful it was that she was able to take a product called Humulin, which is um, not made with animals at all and doesn't have those side effects and has now taken over in the world of diabetes when people have to inject themselves with an insulin. So it's another of those sort of crackers things that people want to hate and they want to discredit and they want us to go away. <laughs> so we have to um, answer those kinds of questions. But no, that, that, that's not accurate. Yeah. There well, we are. okay. And you see, once again, giving you an opportunity to answer it. But let's yes. say, hypothetically, would you refuse to hire someone uh, in any capacity for PETA if they were dependent upon an animal vaccine? Well, nobody is anymore, luckily, dependent on an animal-based vaccine um, because of the advent of all these um, human cells that we can use and so on, and synthetics. Synthetics have really revolutionized uh, the world of vaccines. But I know what you mean, and we don't require that anybody that we hire be vegan, for example, unless they are in a position where, say, they're going out and advocating vegan um, diets. I mean, they can work in the computer room and they can work in, you know, various places. If they're advocating, like a lettuce lady who wears a costume and hands out vegan hot dogs, would have to be vegan. It, it would be hypocritical not to. But we don't only hire vegans. What we do is say nobody eats or wears or doesn't brings any animal tested products into our offices that would be wrong but we only hire people who are kind and in the interview we say do you think there could ever be a time when you see enough that you would change if they say no 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 i'll never stop hunting or fishing or you know ranching or then they're probably not cut out to come and work for us but we're an educational organization, and I think people come through our door, and if they're kind, they see enough videos, they read enough investigations, and they get enough information that makes it easy for them to switch, and you see them switch, and it's fantastic. All right. One more, because we're really short on time. Why yeah. vegan instead of vegetarian? What, I mean, what's the deal with dairy? <laughs> well, that's an excellent question because people say, well, you don't kill the cow, do you, to get milk and cheese and yogurt? And they say, well, actually you do. There isn't a retirement home for cows used for dairy. Um, the problem is, of course, they are older, maybe not very old, but they're older and a little bit worn out from being artificially impregnated and giving birth constantly, more than they would naturally, before they get shoved down the ramp to their death. And so the dairy cow becomes sort of cheap meat, ground beef and things that go into other pies and so on. But the, it's worse for her because the mother cow loves her baby. She's artificially inseminated. She's pregnant about as long as a human mother is. She gives birth, and within hours or days, the farmer comes along. If she's a dairy cow, they winch her. They tie a, a chain or a rope to the calf's foot, and they winch that calf away. And that mother calf calls out after her baby. She loses her baby almost instantly, and she grieves. One cow... Broke I'm going to have I'm going to have to hold you right there. I'm sorry, Ingrid. Uh, we're out of time. In in about 15 seconds, give everybody your website so that they can find out more about PETA and join in the cause. Sure. And buy soy and almond milk for that mother cow. It's PETA dot 
Org, O-R-G, will help you with anything. We've even got vegan mentors to help you with any difficulty. All right. I'd love to have you on the show. We're going to have to bring you back. There's so much more I want to ask you about, including how you get all these beautiful women to take their clothes off and walk (laughs) around. Thank you for your work, Ingrid, and for your willingness to share it with us. We're out of time. I want to thank all of you out there for joining us today, and I hope you enjoyed our show and will join us again next week. Until then, wherever you are in the world, remember, believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com.